What I'd like to do now is give you a little bit of background on concurrency and parallelism, uh, particularly as it applies to Java. But you'll see the first part of the discussion is more broad than that, and then we'll narrow it in on Java. What I'm going to do here is explain what these concepts mean. What does it mean to be concurrent? What does it mean to be parallel? And these terms are often used interchangeably, but they're actually not the same thing, although they're you know, related. They're like in the same family. They're just not identical twins. And so I'll explain how they compare and contrast. And then I'll give you a really brief history of concurrency and parallelism in Java. And that might be useful because you know, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But if you don't know it, it's useful to kind of see where we've come from. And it'll also be a nice tour of how things have evolved more generally in the computing field over the past 20 years or so. So what is concurrency? Concurrency is a form of computing where threads can run simultaneously. Now, this word simultaneously is intentionally a bit vague. So does simultaneously mean they run at the same time, which is physically parallel? Or does it mean that they are interleaved in such a way that it appears that they're running at the same time? And that's one of the distinctions between concurrent and parallel. We'll talk about that later. Here's how it works under the hood. We've talked a bit about this before, but this is going to go into more of the underlying concepts. So a thread in Java is a unit of execution for instruction streams that can run concurrently on multiple processor cores. Now, there may only be one core, but even in that case, it could still run concurrently by being interleaved, by having a thread scheduler let a thread run for a short period of time suspend it, let something else run for a short period of time, suspend it, bring the other one back, and so on and so forth. So if you recall, we could say new thread, give it some computation to run, and then it will run and be mapped somehow onto the underlying processor cores, which are illustrated by Apple cores here. In traditional programs, like Java 7 and before, concurrency was typically used to offload work from the main thread onto background threads. Why the heck would you ever want to do that? Well, in most programs that have a graphical user interface, they typically identify one thread of control as being a special thread called the user interface thread. So you can see here we have an Android application with some GUI stuff. And one of the threads is the UI thread. And that's the one that's responsible for interacting with the display either getting input from the user or flinging content to be displayed to the user's screen. Those are the main things that the UI thread does. Long running operations cannot run on the UI thread for a variety of reasons, which we'll get to later. And so as a result, they need to run in the background. So a common use kind of in classical environments is to have extra threads to run background computations, longer running computations in the background. Any questions about that? That's a typical use of concurrency, is to have some things going on in the background, some things going on in the foreground, and then being able to communicate back and forth. Now, the threads can interact with each other via several different techniques. They break into two general categories, shared objects or shared memory, and message passing, either local or remote. For the discussion at the moment, let's assume, for sake of argument, that the programmer writing is all running in one address space, one so-called process. And so you can either have objects that live in that process that can be shared by the multiple threads by making method calls on them from different threads. Or they can be passing messages back and forth from one thread to another. Now, this, this all whole thing generalizes if you end up with threads in multiple processes, but we're not going to talk about that right now. One of the key things to be concerned with when you start writing multi-threaded programs, so-called concurrent programs, in Java or whatever, language you choose, C sharp, C++, C, is to share resources safely and efficiently to avoid race conditions. Now, there are other things that can go wrong, too, but this is the most common thing that goes wrong. And a race condition basically occurs when a program depends on the sequence or timing of its threads for it to operate properly. So the classic example, which we'll look at shortly, is you've got multiple threads of control, and they're sharing a common data structure and it's not protected by any kind of lock or synchronizer. And so things will be adjusted inconsistently. And there's a whole bunch of issues related to atomicity and visibility and ordering and so on. And so if you program concurrent programs, you've got to be worried about all of that kind of stuff. 
Just as a quick side note, one of the great things about the Java 8 features we'll discuss, parallel streams and completable futures, is you can often write very sophisticated, powerful, and scalable programs that use multi-threading and, and multiple processing cores without having to know anything about synchronization whatsoever. So the race conditions can just disappear from your entire world of concern, if, if you do it right. Here's a simple example. If you want to see an example of a race condition, go take a look at my buggy queue example. And this shows a case where a producer thread and a consumer thread are bumping into each other and corrupting a shared queue, which is implemented as a bounded buffer, because they are not properly synchronized, just to show what goes wrong. And if you run the program, you'll see it gets the wrong answer and probably crashes. All right, so that's concurrency. So the key thing to remember about concurrency is Threads can run simultaneously. We typically use it to offload work to the background. And if we are concurrent in our programming, we have to be worried about things like race conditions, among other stuff. There's other problems like deadlock. There's other problems like live lock and so on. But race conditions are the big, big challenge here. Let's switch over to parallelism. So what's parallelism? Parallelism is a form of computing where you partition a task or a set of tasks into subtasks and allow those subtasks to run independently. And then as the subtasks complete, we combine their partial results into a final result. And we'll take a lot of, we'll look at this quite a bit as we go through the course, but here's a high level view. So we've got a task and then we break that up into subtasks. We, we fork or split a big task into smaller tasks and we may do that recursively until we end up with subtasks that are small enough that they can run efficiently in their own thread. And then each of these subtasks are processed sequentially in different threads, in different cores, right? So they're running in parallel. Each sequential computation runs in parallel. And then as they finish, the results, the partial results that they compute are joined together in order to create a final result. So that's really what parallelism is about. It's about dividing things up. And it's a divide and conquer like approach. The key issue here, the key goal, all right, the thing that we work hard to make sure is ensured, is to figure out how to partition the tasks into subtasks efficiently, right? Because if it takes forever to break things up, we're not getting much of a win. And then we also have to be able to efficiently combine the results. If it takes forever to combine the results, we don't get a win. So those are some of the goals of, of a parallel computing infrastructure. So you can really think about parallelism as a performance optimization. The idea is by applying a parallel solution, then you can increase the throughput because you can do more work because you can run it in parallel. You can increase scalability because you can do more things rather than a few things. And you may also be able to decrease latency, which is a way to make things more responsive. So these are all good things, right? Throughput, scalability, and latency are all good things to optimize. And parallelism can help with that. Keep in mind, and I'll come back and talk about this later, that if you don't do a good job of decomposing your problem into parallel pieces, you're going to end up doing more work with your parallel solution than your sequential solution. Why is that? A sequential solution always does less work than a parallel solution because a sequential solution just has to process sequentially, whereas a parallel solution has to break things up into sub-pieces and then reassemble the results later, whereas a sequential version just has to do the work. Now, obviously, if you play your cards right and you do the partitioning and recomposing, re recombining efficiently, then the fact that things can really run at the same time will give you a win. But that's the, that's the trick, right? And that doesn't always apply. So the challenge is to know when to apply and how to use the mechanisms to do that. Parallelism works best when there's no shared mutable state between threads. So this goes back to the discussion we had earlier about race conditions. If the threads or the cores that are running in parallel are sharing stuff, and that stuff can be changed, now we've got a whole new kettle of fish to worry about because we have to make sure that we protect those variables from parallel access or concurrent access. There are ways to do that, and you can do it, but it works best if you don't have shared mutable state. So we'll talk a bit about that as we go further. There's a great talk by Brian Getz, who's one of the architects for Java. He focuses a lot on on concurrency and parallelism. 
And he has a talk called From Concurrent to Parallel. You can watch it here. I, I highly recommend you watch it. It's got great insights about all the things we just summarized here. He's got like an hour talking about what I just covered in five minutes. And one of the points he makes, which is really the key thing to remember in this whole class, is that Java 8 does two really cool things. It adds functional programming features, which we just talked about, and it combines them with fine-grained data parallelism support in order to leverage the new generation of so-called many-core processors, where you have you know, 8, 12, 16, you know, 32, whatever, 64 cores on a piece of silicon, a system on a chip. And that's the way the world's going. You know, we're, we're getting lots more um, processors. We're not getting them quite as fast as we thought we would, but they're, they're, they're coming along pretty fast. And Java 8 makes it a lot easier to program that scale of multi-core processor. All right. So those are just some things to remember. The key thing to remember are concurrency and parallelism. It's a great quiz question. How do you differentiate the two? Let's talk about the history of these features in Java. When Java first came out, and this goes back a very long time, back to the dawn of time for some of you, literally, uh, the mid-90s is when Java first came out. When Java first came out in Java 1.0, which was mid-90s, we had built-in monitor objects and Java threads. Those were the main features that were there. And <clears throat> the focus was really on very basic multi-threading and synchronization primitives. For example, here's a simple example that uh, allows multiple threads to communicate via a bounded buffer. So we're going to go ahead and make ourselves a queue. And this blocking queue will then be accessed by a producer thread and a consumer thread. We start the threads. You can't quite see it here, but it says join. We're going to join them at the bottom. And that's a way to spawn threads to run concurrently. Now, if we have multi-core, they'll run in parallel. If we have one core, the threads will switch back and forth as they block or run out of their, their time quantum for execution. Here's how we start these threads, and here's how we join them. You can also use very simple primitives in the early versions of Java called built-in monitor objects. And we probably won't spend a lot of time on them in this class. They're, they're sort of the old school way of doing things, as you'll see. And they basically allow you to ensure mutual exclusion, which means only one thread at a time can execute in a chunk of code. And that's really to ensure atomicity, ordering, and visibility. And it also supports so-called coordination. That allows multiple threads to coordinate the order in which they run. So here's a very simple example from our simple blocking queue, where we're going to have a method called take, which is going to try to get the next item off the queue, if there is one. And what it does is it comes in and it, it synchronizes, which says only one thread at a time is going to be in the critical section to avoid these race conditions we talked about. And while there's nothing in the list, we're going to put ourselves to sleep waiting for work to show up, waiting for a, an item to show up in the queue. And then after we've got an item, we're going to tell everybody, hey, the queue's no longer empty. You might want to wake up and, and do something as a result. OK, so those are some of the, the basic primitives you've got with the early versions of Java. These primitives are very efficient, but they're low level and very limited in capability. There's all kinds of accidental complexities that arise when you try to program at this level. So we won't spend much time in this course on this level of programming. Later, in Java 1.5, which I think came ar around in the sort of early to mid 2000 time frame, so maybe 14 years ago or so, that added a whole pile of new concurrency support. So it had this thing called the executor framework. We'll spend a little time on that. A whole batch of synchronizers like semaphores and condition objects and so on. Blocking queues, atomic objects like atomic integer and atomic long, and various concurrent collections like concurrent hash map, which we'll focus on at various points. So this was a big step forward, much better than what was there earlier. And this allowed people to write coarse-grained task parallelism whose computations can run concurrently. So there's something cool called the executor completion service, where you can submit tasks to execute. And those tasks are run in a pool of worker threads. And as the results are computed, the results are stuck into a queue. And then that queue can be accessed by other threads to get the results. So you can imagine you know, one set of threads 
creating work to do, another set of threads taking the results, and yet another set of threads actually doing the work. So that was sort of coarse-grained task parallelism. We're, we're breaking the tasks down and submitting them to the, the executor completion service to do the work. Here's a, a simple example. If you take a look, there's an example called the Palantiri Manager application. And this basically spawns a pool of threads. It makes some barriers to coordinate how threads access a shared resource. And then we go ahead and execute the threads and do computation. And they coordinate the entry and exit from the pool of computations that are running at the same time. So this is one example of using these sort of Java 5 era features. These are feature rich and very optimized, but they're also extremely tedious and error prone to program. It's full of accidental complexities. So if you can avoid it, you don't want to have to program like this, although a lot of code is still written this way today for various reasons. With Java 1.7 or JDK 7, foundational parallelism support became part of Java. So up to that point, it was primarily focused on concurrency, running things in the background. With Java 7 came along parallelism support. And the idea was to use what's called data parallelism. And in data parallelism, you have the same task, and you execute it on different chunks of data. And that gets into this sort of divide-conquer-like model that we see here. So you have a task, like you're going to do image processing or whatever, or image crawling or something. Uh, web, web image crawling, and you fork it into subtasks, and those things fork, and you finally end up with a bunch of things that all run <laughs> sequentially but in parallel, because each of them is running in parallel, and they work on a subset of the data, and then those things are all joined back together again. So there's an example here called search stream fork join that uses this common fork join pool that's part of Java 7 to search for the input strings in parallel. So it's kind of like the example we looked at earlier except now we're, we're doing it with a Java 7 level feature called the fork join pool, which is really cool and very, very scalable, very optimized to work for this stuff. So even though this is, these features are very powerful and scalable, they're really tricky to program concurrently. I will cover some of this stuff later because it's important to understand how it works under the hood. But if you can avoid it, you don't want to have to program at this level because you'll go crazy from all the little intricacies and having to keep track of how you join these things and fork them, even though the framework does a lot for you. So where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us with what we're going to be focusing on primarily in this course, which is the new stuff, the Java 8 stuff. And this is advanced parallelism support. So what came along in Java 8, or JDK 1.8, is parallel streams and completable futures. And those are the brand new way of doing things. And what they allow you to do is they allow you to use functional programming, which simplifies a lot of the coding that was otherwise, otherwise have to be done manually. You raise the level of abstraction at which you work to allow you to do data parallelism by something called parallel streams. And we'll talk a lot about those shortly. That's one of the major advances that we have in Java 8. And asynchronous programming using a reactive functional model called completable futures. And those approaches are really cool. And if you play your cards right, you have lots of neat benefits, which I'll summarize shortly. Here's a very simple example of this. I think I've alluded to this before. This example is going to uh, run a bunch of computations in parallel. Those computations will take a list of URLs, and it'll break it up into chunks of the URLs. It'll uh, filter out the ones that have already been downloaded. For ones that have not been downloaded, it'll download them in parallel. It'll apply them, uh, apply image filtering, such as you know, grayscale or emboss or whatever, in parallel. And it'll collect all the results back and store them in a list. So it'll do all those kinds of things. And it's arguably very easy to understand this, how this works once you know how to read the syntax. So the benefits of the Java 8 features are it strikes a nice balance between productivity and performance. And as we'll see later, if we do some benchmarking, you'll find out that if you, if you have the right kind of problem and you implement it in the right kind of way, it will work very fast, probably faster than if you'd hard coded it using those other earlier low level mechanisms, unless you're willing to spend an enormous amount of time tweaking all the low level details. So it's a good way to do it. So that's just a quick overview of concurrency and parallelism, just to kind of give you the background necessary to make sense out of the rest of the material.